Awesome. Feel right at home, Kara? Do you feel right at home here? Oh, no? Okay. This little girl is on her second passport, okay? She's been all over the world. She meets new people, so she feels a little shy at the moment. It's, uh, Kara. Lorna, my wife, is going to greet you guys because uh, in my household, I have the last word, and it's uh, yes, dear. So. <laughs> Hello everyone, Ni Hao from China. Sawadika, you have to do the Y. Do that, yeah. Sawadika from Thailand and Kamusta, Mabuhay po from Philippines. Um, I am so glad and privileged and honored to be here with you all. Um, this church has been such a blessing to us, really, for so, so many years. You've been always with us, you've been praying for us, supporting this ministry. And because of what you have been doing, we are able to reach more and reach people groups. And even more, you guys are sending quality people. Thank you so much. I said this this morning at the first service, and I will say it again. Thank you for sending quality people to China. And who knows, someday you'll be sending more in other parts, right? Not just China and beyond, for sure. And thank you so much. And um, we are so honored. And um, you know what? The Lord wanted to tell you that you are so blessed. This country is so blessed. I'm standing here worshiping with you with such freedom. Meanwhile, our, our brothers and sisters in the persecuted countries right now could not even gather for more than 30 minutes with five to 10 people because there's, there is a threat for them. And we have pastors who've been beaten and stoned even after going to the church and preaching the gospel. And we are so blessed. I want to remind you that you are so blessed. We are so blessed. We're here right now in America. And this blessing is not just for us. So we could, God is giving us blessings so we could extend even more to other nations. So thank you. We love you. That is true. Amen. In fact, uh, just to start off by saying this, we have a local missionary. All of them we call by uh, different names online. If you go to withinreachglobal.org, you'll see our outreach centers. We have six outreach centers, uh, 20 first tier missionaries, and then many more. One of them, I can't remember what I call him online. I can't even, we'll call him Brother Leo, okay? He, uh, he, a middle-aged guy, mid or early 40s and uh, he went to begin starting his ministry sharing the gospel among his family and then neighbors every single time he went out they would stone him these guys would beat him up and said if you do that again tomorrow we will beat you and then it got worse and worse every week though he got up and started sharing with his friend, family friends and neighbors grew a church to about 12 people Week after week after week. We have stories on the website, on the blog section. He would stand in that same spot, getting ready to receive his beating, his weekly beating. I mean, every single week. They'd punch him. The last time we saw him, he was just swollen on his face. And, I mean, for us as Westerners, for me, I felt like, gosh, we need to relocate this guy and, you know, not let him continue to speak in these places. But he got up weekly to receive his weekly beating. The church grew because of that persecution to now 120 people. In the midst of persecution, yeah, in the midst of persecution and difficulty and struggle and the hardships you face, God uses those things to advance his kingdom. Amen? Amen. And I started with this a moment ago. I'll say it again. Um, God has rigged the world in such a way that victory can only be experienced through risk. He's rigged it in such a way that victory can only be experienced through risk. You want to see victory in your life, in your finances, in your family, in your friends coming to salvation. You have to walk and step out into precarious places uncertain waters many times and somehow yeah. is as if you're standing on the feet of Jesus and he's walking he's doing all the heavy lifting and you're along for the ride and the waters part lives are changed but in the midst of those difficulty come breakthrough that's what we're seeing at within reach global 
And so my wife and I started this ministry. I've been in Asia now for 22 years of my life. It's more than half my life I've been in Asia. And we have seen this ministry grow. I'm going to be speaking today not only about this far off distant place that you can't pronounce the names because they all start with an X, but I want to think of this message in the context of where you are now. Okay, here we are in this zip code. And God has placed you here for such a time as this. And so, my message today is called, A Missionary King, His Advance Emissaries, and A Waiting World. Wow, that's a mouthful, I know. I always have to think of some creative way of describing things. But that's what we see. A missionary king. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to become the greatest cross-cultural missionary the world has ever seen. And so I said it in the first uh, service as well. Jesus left the most exclusive gated community in all the universe, cross-geographic, linguistic, cultural boundaries, came down, born in a manger, and became a missionary to who? Left all that was good and perfect and came to us. Left the 99 came to the ones, we being the ones. If that be the case, if we serve a missionary king, then we have that missionary spirit, amen? Crossing cultures, going to places that others will not or cannot. My prayer is that all of us would be the type to say, I'm willing to go anywhere and eat anything and sleep anywhere and do anything that the kingdom of God might be advanced in this place in our city, state, zip code, and beyond. And in a moment, we're going to be learning not only about a missionary king, not only recognizing that we are his advanced emissaries to extend his kingdom, but also see the status of a waiting world. And how many people are out there waiting at the other end of our obedience? Revelation 7, 9. Let's start with the end in mind. You flip to the back of the Bible, and this is how... The story culminates in the very end. After this, I looked, and there before me, a great multitude that no one could count. Who were they? They were from every nation, tribe, people, language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, and they were wearing white robes, holding palm branches in their hands, and cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits upon the throne. And so, this is the culmination of the whole story. Do you sometimes feel like as you go through life and try to navigate all these little details of life, you, you have a tendency to forget the plot? Anybody else? <laughs> I mean, we have the kind of lack of purpose, a lack of direction. And is it really just all about the next Christian self-help book? Is it really all about us? Such a myopic, inward-turned vision? I, I think God wants us to see beyond and to see from his viewpoint, his vantage point, right? Uh, you can see the 50,000 foot, but we're always real close up, and that's good, because we need to see it. But at times, we need to step back and see through the eyes of the king, and what does he truly care about? I'll tell you today, he loves people. He loves culture, he loves race, and there are many who are waiting at the other end of our obedience today. Here in the city, and the nations beyond. Let me tell you a little bit about your missionary king. First Chronicles 29, 11. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Psalm 145, 13. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises and faithful in all that he does. You know, I read the New Testament and to get a picture of a glimpse, Jesus' uh, main message, the main point and gist of all that he spoke was about the kingdom of God, right? Funny thing is, most followers of Christ or people who consider themselves Christians today have a hard time describing what is the kingdom of God, right? Nationalism blends into Christianity and we don't know whether or not the kingdoms of the world and the next uh, political 
um, agenda lines up with the kingdom of God. I remember after many years of living overseas, maybe six or seven years, I came back to Prescott, Arizona, where I'm from. Prescott like biscuit, that's what we say, not Prescott. And I walked into a Christian bookstore, saw a painting of Jesus on a cross, okay, in the painting, uh, American flag draped over him on the cross. I hadn't lived in that world for a while, okay? So when nationalism and the kingdoms, the small K kingdoms, blend into what we know as the kingdom, big K kingdom of God, it could be confusing, right? So Jesus' main message was about the kingdom of God. He's a missionary king advancing his kingdom. Jesus said, my kingdom is in the midst of you. The kingdom of God is in the midst of you. It is at hand. It is here with us. So we see that we live in the present tense reality. Anybody here ever experienced healing of any kind? Healing? Uh, have you seen a family or friend give their lives to Jesus and kind of notice the kingdom of God in your midst? Anyone? We live in a present tense reality of the kingdom, right? Then Jesus tells his disciples, pray this way. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, your will be done. So suddenly we see this uh, future tense, right? May it come in the future. It's not quite here as we want it to be. In a moment, you'll see uh, a video of the uh, Myanmar Burma government breaking down crosses in this area. It just happened uh, two months ago. The kingdom of God, the struggles we're experiencing, the kingdom of God has not come like we want it to come yet. But at the second coming of Christ, Jesus comes in ultimate, consummate glory, and he suddenly, there's no confusion about the king of kings and the lord of lords, right? So we live in the messy middle, this now and this not yet kingdom, this present tense and the future kingdom. And so we are his advance emissaries. Anybody want to be an advanced emissary to promote the kingdom of God in Roseville and beyond? We want to see the city, every corner and alcove of this city come to Christ, or at least have an opportunity to hear of him. This is what it says in Isaiah 60, 1 through 3, describing you, the advanced emissaries of God. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn, or the brightness of your rising. You know, who here has heard of the Great Commission? All right. Who has not heard of the Great Commission? You're not quite sure what the Great Commission is. Uh, uh, one bold person. <laughs> Everyone's like, I think I should know. So I... <laughs> Barna Report did a survey in March 2018. 51% of churchgoers don't know what the Great Commission is. The Great Commission is Matthew 28. Jesus says, go, and therefore, into all the nations, uh, making disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Last words of Jesus. Yeah, so mark that now in your Bible. Great Commission. Okay, got it. <laughs> Let's mark off that number, 51%. Of all churchgoers in America don't know what the Great Commission is. Okay, surprising to some of us. Um, appalling to many others. And so Jesus then... Acts 1.8, the very last thing he says before returning to his Father, sending the Holy Spirit as our helper and our guide, <coughs> you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, in Roseville, in the surrounding cities, in this state, to this nation, and beyond. And I want to point out the very important article, and, not or, okay? He says, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the world. It's not or, it's not we get to choose. And we, we live less in a democracy in the big K kingdom of God than we do a monarchy or at least a benevolent dictator. I mean, that is our king. We don't vote in the next guy. 
Jesus is, and that's it. And we don't really have much of a choice, but thankfully, he's a benevolent dictator. He's, we live in a monarchy, and we see the kingdom of God, and he sends us out as his sent ones. We must be global Christians with a global vision, because our God is a global God. John R. W. Stott said, went on to say, do we claim to believe in God? He's a missionary God. You tell me you're committed to Christ. He's a missionary Christ. Are you filled with the Holy Spirit? He is a missionary spirit. Do you belong to the church? This is a mission, missionary society. And do you hope to go to heaven when you die? It's a heaven into which the fruits of world mission have been and will be gathered. I pray that you, like myself, I know I have this passion, would say with C.T. Studd, missionary to Asia and then Africa later in his life, 120 years ago, some wish to live within the sound of church and chapel bell, and I can almost see him laugh. <laughs> I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. It's, it's time, I know the Holy Spirit oftentimes calls us into dark places. So if you feel like you're going through a struggle, whether it's financial, familial, your family members have, you know, there's some struggle, whatever it is, there are times when I believe the Holy Spirit leads us into darkness that we as his advanced emissaries of a missionary king might illuminate the atmosphere with his glory. Amen? Yeah. Don't be afraid of those dark places. You, after all, are the salt and the light of the world. Amen? Tell the person next to you, you're pretty salty today. <laughs> I don't know why I picked that phrase. I just happened. <laughs> so many better things I could have asked you to say. <laughs> so we know our, we have a missionary king, a king who has missionary tendencies or characteristics. We know that we are the advanced emissaries of God to usher in his kingdom and reign. Let me tell you now about a waiting world. I refer to them as people waiting at the other end of your obedience. It's not a far leap, but they are on the other end of your obedience. This is the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to become the greatest cross-cultural missionary the world has ever seen. And this is the world as we know it in our context, my wife Lorna and mine, Anybody ever heard of the 1040 window? Yeah? 1040 window is the 10 to 40 degrees latitude north of the equator, stretching from northwest Africa through the Middle East into the Asias, the bulk of the unreached people groups who have no gospel access. In this part of the world, excuse me, there are so many, countless thousands, actually 2.4 billion people who have never once, wow, I know, right, Kara? Who've never heard the name of Jesus. We call them gospel deprived. There are no churches, no missionaries, no Christians, no Christian bookstore, no Christian radio station. We'll walk into a village, right, Kara? We've done this many times. Actually, you were with Aunt Addie and many others here, the Murphys, and we walk into these villages and say, I heard Ryan say that when we were in China. Yeah. <laughs> it came out a little different. <laughs> Have you ever heard of Jesus here before? And one guy asked me, Is that a brand of a soap? <laughs> they have no concept what in the world Jesus is. Another guy said, oh, uh, he was here last week, but I think he's gone now. <laughs> Just trying to appease me, so I missed Jesus by one week. <laughs> the fact, the reality is, they have no concept about what Jesus is, who he is, right? So you have 86% of Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, not outwardly rejecting the Jesus we know and love, no. They have never once met a Christian, never heard of the gospel, not once. We talk about the second coming of Christ. One third of the world has never heard of the first. Wow. Okay? So, on the next slide, you'll see this. Each dot represents an ethnic people group, different tribe with their own culture, custom, history, right? The dark green is significantly reached. You'll generally see that in uh, southern 
Africa, in the Americas, South Central Latin America. Light green is partially reached, yellow superficially reached, orange minimally reached, red unreached. Okay, we're not talking about Aunt Mildred down in the cul-de-sac who doesn't believe in Jesus. That's not unreached. Unreached is there's no opportunity for these people to ever hear the gospel unless we begin to think with a missionary mindset like our missionary king. This is our corner of the world. On the next slide there. Asia, home to 4.5 billion people. In fact, where we live in Chiang Mai, Thailand, you take an airplane ride three hours in any direction, you will be in contact with half the world's population. A little less than 4 billion people. Zooming in a little farther, this is where we work in Thailand and China. China, with a population of 1.4 billion people, there are over 500 ethnic people groups, I think it's the next slide there, over 500 ethnic people groups, um, 24 of these we are seeking to reach at Within Reach Global. We have six outreach centers, 21st tier missionaries going into these places, again, eating anything, sleeping anywhere, doing anything. Who's ready to come visit us and eat anything? All right, when I say anything now, I'm, I mean... <laughs> Grub worm. Not you. Yeah, you've already done it, right? Chicken's feet, chicken combs, every part of the chicken. All right. So that's China. And next, Thailand. 69 million people in this country, okay? 95% of those are Buddhist. Okay. Less than 1%, 0.7% to be exact, are Christian out of six, 69 million people. We live there in the heart of the unreached world. I believe God is calling us in your sphere of influence to think with a missionary perspective. Not all of you are going to cross geographic and linguistic and cultural boundaries and go to Timbuktu or the uttermost parts of the world. Um, many of you are, and please don't say no. Have a yes to God. He's waiting on your availability more than your abilities. Amen? So your yes means a lot. But not all of us will do that. Okay? We will minister within our spheres of influence. But I want to encourage you with this. There are people who are waiting for a touch, an introduction, a glimpse of a kingdom they don't understand, and that is through your life. You, as a missional, sent one into these areas. Real briefly, I want to give you a better, even closer look at the reality of our world today. Okay? Is this okay? You guys flowing with me here? Yeah? yeah. Don't want to sound like it's a classroom setting here. Let's go to the next one. Let's look at where Christians live. Okay? Um, here's a little... Yeah, the last one was a close-up. So there's... More than 2 billion Christians in the world today. Basically, roughly a third of the world is Christian population. Um, I'm just going to breeze through these. There are, in the t days of Jesus, there was one church for every 200 people groups. Okay? Today, there are 900 churches for every un one unreached group. If we wanted to bring the gospel to the ends of the earth, if we wanted to finish the Great Commission call, Matthew 24, 14, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a testimony to every nation, and then what happens, what we all want to happen, the end comes, then we need to finish the task that Jesus gave us in our context. We have more than enough resources to do that. However, our priorities are often so inwardly myopically uh, aligned. We, we think so much, we think so highly of ourselves. Am I, am I the only one here? <laughs> Comfort, I don't recall as being one of like the real values that Jesus had, right? You know, I mean, he didn't come just to, for us to be, yes, there's an aspect of that. But I think we value the aspects of comfort and security and safety much more than the promises of Jesus. Here's a promise of Jesus. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. Yeah. You're welcome, <laughs> says Jesus. And so he calls us as kind of a missionary spirit, right, to be missionally minded. And in Chinese, we have a statement. 
Jing Di Zhuo, The Frog in the Bottom of the Well. I've always loved this visual because you can imagine a frog in the bottom of this deep well and looking up, his only horizon is a blue dot. It describes someone as very uh, narrow-minded or myopic uh, perspective. So his whole horizon is a blue dot and that's all he knows. And oftentimes that's us, isn't it? I mean, it's just all about us, our little tiny corner of the world. And yet, when the Holy Spirit begins, you allow God to pour in the Spirit, the water of the Spirit, it raises you up, and you rise up, and the, the blue dot widens, and the horizon broadens, and you see a perspective, a macro perspective of what the king might see, people and nations and places, people waiting at the other end of your obedience. Quickly, missionaries that we send out. And when, I, when I talk about missionaries, I'm talking about uh, in the context of those who cross cultural, geographic, and or linguistic barriers. All of us are called as sent ones. Jesus sends us out. You don't always have to use the word missionary, but we are all missional, to be missionally minded, sent ones. Out of these, yeah, if you go to the next one there, 400,000 missionaries in the world today, you could read the rest. The problem is, we don't always send these missionaries to the places of greatest need or highest difficulty, right? So imagine one third of the world population, you guys are the Christians, one third of the world population, you've heard the gospel but have decided against Christ, or maybe you're just, just not a believer. Third part of the world, you guys have never once heard of Jesus before. We'll take 30 people as missionaries, and where will we send them? Where the need is greatest? No. <laughs> we'll stick 28 of them, or 27 of them over here, talking to other Christians about Jesus. Okay. Two of them will send to you guys, and one single individual to reach all of you. We, we have a misprioritization of, of our, God, our king's heart, Jesus, who would leave the 99 for the sake of the ones I want you to think right now of the ones in your life. Who are they? Perhaps it's a family member. Perhaps it's a friend. Perhaps it is um, a stranger. Visualize their, their face and know you may be their only link to a kingdom, the kingdom of God. You as a sent one. Don't be afraid to traverse precarious waters and take the gospel to them. And then real quickly, money and missions. We spend, well, Christians make uh, $42 trillion globally. $700 billion goes to Christian causes of any kind. $45 billion we'll give to missions. But remember, the missions is the ones where we send back to the Christian's world. Okay, uh, less than about 2% roughly is money that will go, that's 45, 450 million money that goes to unreached. So I know that if, Generally, churches take an offering and give a hundred bucks. Today, I know I'll receive one penny of that to go to the unreached world. Every one hundred dollars, one penny goes to missions among unreached world. Okay, this thankfully is not the case at the Rock of Roseville, because you guys go to China, to difficult places, to Haiti, and that's what I love. You have this willingness to go where others, many others, will not. You could, you could get all these on my website, davidjoannis.com. There's a shameless plug for you. Um, you know, right now, I want to show you this video. As we talk about persecution and struggle in difficult areas, right now in China, you can show that video, they are knocking down, this is about two months ago, they were removing crosses in Myanmar, right on the border of China. This just took place two months ago and is happening right now for the sake of those who are Christians, simply for their faith in Jesus. They're demolishing churches. In fact, they captured a number of our local missionaries, shackled their hands and feet, shaved their heads, marched them throughout the city as a way of publicly shaming them. You'll see that in just a second on the next frame there. And these are the difficulties that our brothers and sisters are facing right now for the sake of the gospel. Because of this persecution, however, the church has grown tremendously. 
there's over 120 million Christians in China. One of our local mission, that, by the way, that's more than the Communist Party members, which are about 90 million. Wow. Government's not happy about that, okay? <laughs> um, one of our local missionaries, we'll call her Bright Eyes in this public setting, uh, oversees 1,400 orphaned and or underprivileged children in 74 villages all throughout this region. Their parents have either died or there's drug abuse. It's a home to methamphetamine production and human trafficking, just a difficult part of the world. I personally have been interrogated 22 times for my service in China. I've been slapped on the face once or twice. Um, but she is seeing breakthrough. I would, I would encourage you, head on over to withinreachglobal.org or Facebook or whatever. Yes, it's okay if you pull out your phone and right here in the middle of service. <laughs> Check out these photos of these children, 75 kids raising their hands. Just months ago, they'd never heard of what a Jesus is. Now, they and their families are coming to Christ. I say this because this is our context. And I say this in our context to give you hope for yours. This is not something that happens in the missions world and impossible to take place here. No, this is the spirit of our missionary king. And he imparts us with all surpassing power. Uh, as the second Corinthians 2, 4 says, we, we have this all surpassing power in jars of clay. And the things about jars of clay, they leak. Right? You got a crack here and a fracture here, and we're always leaking. And thank God we have all surpassing power inside because it leaks out to those in most need. Don't be afraid of those cracks and fissures inside of your cracked jar of clay. You have all surpassing power in you. And that is what is going to permeate the darkness and bring light to those areas. As I stood with Lorna on top of a mountain, <laughs> overlooking Myanmar, that's formerly Burma, and China, as far as the eye could see, I knew there were no known missionaries, Christians, churches, any opportunity to hear the gospel. It reminded me of the statement by Robert Moffat, father-in-law of David Livingstone, pioneer, said, he said this, in the vast plain to the north, I have seen at different times the smoke of a thousand villages, villages whose people are without Christ, without God, and without hope in the world. And this next statement is as true as it is in the unreached world as it is for people here. The gospel is only good news if it gets there in time. We're living in a world that our missional, our Christian efforts to establish the kingdom are not moving as fast as population growth. So there are people who will born, be born, live, and die and never have an opportunity to hear Christ. Who is their link? We are their link. We, you are the advanced emissaries of a missionary king called to establish his kingdom. Matthew 24, 14 says this. I learned it in Chinese before I learned it in English. This gospel has to go to every part of the planet as if Jesus is waiting for us to join him in his epic narrative. And then he says, yes, okay, the end will come. And the return of our glorious king, as we see in Revelation 7, 9. One more time, I'd like to read that scripture. Revelation 7, 9, this is the culmination of the story. And here you will see people speaking different languages, having different cultures. Some will be from Roseville. Most will not be speaking English. You better start learning Chinese quick. <laughs> After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude, which no one could count, from Roseville, from California, from America, from the nations surrounding, and every tribe and people and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and unto the Lamb. Formerly, these people were called unreached, and we still call them unreached today. But prophetically, my wife and I believe that these people are actually within reach. The people in your sphere of influence are finally within reach. Should you make the choice 
to operate with a missionary mind like your king, step out into precarious situations to advance the kingdom, you will see great breakthrough. Why? Because of you, a broken jar of clay? <laughs> no, because of the all-surpassing power inside of you. And he, we're God's choice, or his first choice, his plan A, and unfortunately, he doesn't have a plan B. So we are it, and he loves us to join him on mission. Now, I'll just give you a couple, few last points. Um, how can we respond to today? I, again, apologize if I talk in our context and it feels foreign. Um, I pray that you would kind of visualize the people in your area. Pray. Prayer is the mighty engine that is to move the missionary work. Your prayers shift atmospheres and change the nations. I mean, how many stories have I heard? And Lauren and I were driving around this cliff 24 hours to the border of Burma, almost slipped off the edge of a cliff at the last second before a 500-foot drop. She said, in the name of Jesus, and our car stopped about right there. And we got out and cried, and seriously, we built an altar, and God spared us. And I remember someone telling us, we were praying for you at this time, such and such time. It was that exact moment. Your prayers truly do shift atmospheres di through distance and locally. Continue to pray that God will give you open doors. Your financial giving, I don't know if you know this or not, but The Rock has long been supporting Within Reach Global. I think the first time I came here was 15 years ago, maybe? I, 18? <laughs> 18 years ago. Um, and I was just fresh and green on the mission field. Yeah, I gotta go for Jesus, eat anything, sleep anywhere. And I got diarrhea a lot of times because of that. <laughs> but I've wised up over the years, and you guys have wised up and seen this is something God's doing in the nations, and your giving is impacting lives. I am excited to introduce those people, those lives to you uh, in, in, in heaven. Um, we love you guys as always sending the best, like Lorna said, the best coming overseas on short-term trips, and uh, we'll continue to do that. I would also encourage you, um, last, uh, well, 2017, I read 54 books, a book a week. They found them, them their way into this book. I wrote it, it's called The Mind of a Missionary, What Global Kingdom Workers Tell Us About Thriving on Mission Today. So you have all these people. We're part of a great cloud of witnesses who've gone here and there and elsewhere. And now we don't want to have this myopic perspective. How can you thrive on mission today? I would encourage you to pick that up as well as my other book there. You can learn all about our interrogations, and food poisoning, et cetera, et cetera. In the end though, I pray that the missionary king that we have who traversed culture, geographic, geographical and linguistic boundaries, left the most exclusive gated community in the whole universe and came to us, that his imprint would print upon your heart and soul and passionately say, I'm willing to go anywhere and eat anything and sleep anywhere and do anything that your kingdom might be established here in our midst. In this now and not yet kingdom, we want to speed the return of, of Christ. So can we all just stand up real quick as I pray over you? And I love to pray just real briefly in Chinese, a blessing representing the Chinese underground church. Our brothers and sisters, there's not the persecuted church and not persecuted, but the bigger body of Christ. And this is what they would say should you be in an underground church in China. Shida Chu, ni shu wang wang chu wang, ni shu wang chu chu. 你是美国的上帝,你是中国的神,你是普天下的上帝,主啊,我们完全的把这每一个弟兄姊妹放在你的手中,请来看过来带领来祝福, and Lord, we pray that your kingdom would come upon everyone here, that we would see beyond, see a macro perspective of your glory in the nations inclusive of us and know that we are a part of your epic story we want to be part of it god we don't want to be on the sidelines we want to jump in with you father and say for your glory and your kingdom so inspire and encourage those of us here who are struggling to take the next step 
and say, yes, Lord, I don't have much ability, but you have my availability. And here's my yes. And we step out with you. Even if we have to walk on your feet or step on your feet as you walk and carry us, bless this body to experience signs, wonders, and miracles in your kingdom coming in and through this body to the nations. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stay standing. Let's honor David. You know, one of our core values here at The Rock is mission. And one of our favorite things to hear is, man, you guys talk about missions quite a bit. We know we're doing our job. We hear that report back. Um, you just this morning hearing this twice, it, it's really important for us to understand that we are a global church, not just a local church. And we think about our context of Christianity. You can come to The Rock or go to another church. You think, man, I would love to check out that church down the road. Maybe they have a better service or worship team. That's not the case overseas. They're looking for shelter and safety, just being able to worship their God with their voices, with others. And it's important for us to talk about the global mission as Bob and I, you know, pray and Mark and Ryan pray about who's meant to speak. You know, Bob was set up this week and got got ill. And we said, you know, David's already come to share a testimony. We, we have to listen to what the Spirit is saying. And for us, he's saying, will you support my global church and not just sustain your own little thing? And we really want to see missionaries sent out. You know, we're excited about their school. They're opening up in Thailand, uh, which is exciting for missionaries, similar to like a YWAM base, uh, but in particular for unreached groups. So do us a favor. Just extend your hands out towards uh, David and Lord. and invite up some leaders here. Let's pray for them and bless them as they are doing work uh, that, as we've heard, few are doing. So, Father, we just thank you for this amazing couple. As I met David, I remember 18 years ago with your epically long hair. Remember your long hair? It was great. It was great. <laughs> But Father, I thank you for the years, blood, sweat, and tears that they've invested. Many, after this long, would have called it quits. But God, they called upon your faithfulness and you answered. And God, I just pray for endurance, that you're running the race. Lord, I thank you. I just get that picture of you sowing and dumping bags of seed everywhere you go. And you say, God, I hope that this seed sets. I hope there's going to be fruit. Father, I just am so grateful and excited to stand with my brother. When we stand together on the other side of eternity and look at all the fruit that's been produced, even the hard conversations. And I just even feel um, God wants to wash away all the broken promises from churches and missionaries that didn't follow through with what they promised. God, I pray for a new season as they are pioneering work with new missionaries. That they would not go through the pain of broken promises and dysfunction of churches that they experienced themselves. But God, this new age, this new generation, this next 20 years would feel the fruit of the, the tilling of soil, of the foundation being set. Now is the season to build. And Lord, we just declare they've established this foundation on the rock. And no matter what storm comes, it will stand. So, Father, would you come and bless our friends here and bless their little one with her extravagant call to seek you and to sing and to lead others in song. God, we thank you that there's going to be no sickness that will come against this family and even any early signs of things that have not been able to peg what maybe that sickness or illness is. God, we say this is not going to settle. The enemy's hands must be removed from this family. We declare healing and grace and strength. And even further miracles would take place. So we just pray for the grace for signs and wonders, miracles, creative miracles upon David and Lorna as they pray for those with missing appendages and even lost eyes, God, that they would see the miraculous in their midst. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. One more time, we honor David and Lorna.